Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Blue Collar Sports Talk. Going to give you a quick rundown of what we're going to talk about today. We'll give you a little bit of Husker news to start off with. We'll discuss a little finals in the NHL. We'll take a look at how the NBA finals are going. We're going to discuss some movies with sports. Or is it sports with movies? Either way. And then we're going to have some final thoughts. Or are the movies our final thoughts? Do we have any thoughts? Well, anyway, here's our show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to June the 8th, Blue Collar Sports Talk. Daryl here. Morning. James there. And uh, I'm going to start off with a Pat Riley quote. Pat Riley. Oh, they need a good quote for him. Anytime you stop striving to get better, you're bound to get worse. Fact. Um, and now switching gears right into Husker news. How about them Huskers? So uh, we're another day closer to volleyball day, and they announced. Did you see who they announced the yes. musical act is? Yes, Scotty McCreary, everybody's favorite. I, that was I a guess. little. That was a little tongue in cheek. Right. Not not everybody's a country fan, but it, it, it's tough. I think when you have to pick a a musical act that kind of stays within. University of Nebraska's uh, ideology. I'll just leave it at right. that. Right, right. So they announced Scotty McCreary, August 30th, musical act, volleyball day, Memorial Stadium. Now, the last thing that I read besides Scotty McCreary is the uh, last week I mentioned they released more tickets, about 8,000 more. So they say that's around 91,000. Yes. That doesn't include staff and it doesn't include credentialed media. So I really feel that they're going for the world record. Yes. So awesome. Set the bar high. Yeah. Right? Um, other other Husker news. Um, Nebraska golfer Lindsey Tile gave the Huskers a state women's match play champion for the third consecutive year. Not only has she done it, her sister Hannah... Also a Husker golfer, won a Nebraska match play championship in 2016. And her oldest and their oldest sister, right. Haley, won the state women's stroke play title in 2017. What a talented golf family. Wow. Can you imagine those outings? Oh, man. Man, yeah. by the time you get home, you know, if you didn't have that good round. Ooh. Yeah. Happy we man. have them as a Husker. Um, the volleyball team is still in Brazil. Doing really well. Yeah. I mean, they're playing some younger girls and maybe not as talented, but a lot of quality, quality volleyball. If you guys got to see any of that, they, was, they looked really good. Now, this is interesting. <clears throat> this is something that I, I really don't follow, but it, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great honor to have a Nebraska rifle captain that's a junior. Cecilia Ossie won the USA Shooting Women's Small Bore National Championship. Oh. And uh, she carries the highest shooting average of any Husker this year and placed in the top 10 in every match she's competed in this season. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know we had that. Right, right, right. So <laughs> I, think, I think it's interesting that it, um, we have some amazing talent and across all sports. Yeah, and we were talking last night at work that there's numerous Nebraska sports. Obviously, football, volleyball is the biggest, but our, you know, our golf does really well. The bowling does really well. Third this year, you know, we didn't even know, or a lot of people didn't even know they won the championship the year before. You know, the men's and women's gymnastics that compete in the golf and the wrestling, and those are bigger name sports. And then you bring in shooting and the golfing that people really miss, and they, oh well, our football team, we must suck at everything. No, we we don't. We actually have a lot of really good athletes here in Nebraska that. We just got to give them a chance. 
So I looked up her profile on Huskers.com and her previous school, check this out. Th- this tells you that she is, uh, she is on the right team. She's on, she's on our rifle team, right? She's on our shooting team. Her previous school, New Jersey muzzle loader. <laughs> That's their mascot? The muzzle loader? I don't know if it's their mascot or it's part of their name. Oh my. I, I didn't check into it. I just saw that that was the previous school name. So, again, kudos to Cecilia. Um, since we're in college sports, did you want to mention? Yeah. So, um, for big baseball fans, I know, yes, Nebraska didn't make it. Uh, but College World Series is down in the Sweet 16. That all starts tonight. Uh, then we'll get into the the final Eight, and obviously that'll be here uh, starting June 16th. Uh, you got, <clears throat> excuse me, some new teams. Uh, like, well, like I said, it's only Sweet 16, so we'll have to see who shows up. But teams like Duke, TCU, Indiana State, uh, Oral Roberts are in uh, Sweet 16 right now. Usual candidates, you have Virginia, South Carolina, Florida, and their Oregon's starting to make a normal appearance. Uh, Wake Forest, the number one overall seed. Uh, of course, LSU's in there, Tennessee. So um, it's going to be interesting. Like I said, Sweet 16, and then we'll get to the lead eight or the final teams come, that come here to Omaha uh, June 16th. And then on the women's side, their championship has started. Oklahoma beat Florida State yesterday. I believe it was 5 nothing. Um, maybe a little bit more. Oh, wow. Yeah, Florida State looked good. They're holding their own, but... Oklahoma State, Oklahoma is just so powerful, going for the third consecutive championship. And, oh, by the way, their pitcher, Jody, I can't remember last, is actually here from here in Papillion. Yeah. So that's awesome. Good for her. Uh, they, I can't say cruise control. Florida State's very tough. So uh, let's check them out later on tonight, 7, o- 7 o'clock, I believe it is. All right. The, the, um, NHL finals. Huge. I, Yep. And not saying I called it or anything because it's not like you know, I actually lost the hockey bet. So it's not like I know what I'm talking about. But it, it's going the way I thought to where no matter how good Florida's defense was going to play, uh, Golden Knights just scored too much. I mean, there's a really, really good scoring team. They've outscored them 12 to 4 in the first two games. Five goals the first game, seven goals the second game. And, it, I mean, Florida's main goal is to get two or three goals and play good solid D. And I don't know if it's Vegas' speed or the different line shifts that they give them and different looks, but it's making it very hard on Florida. Uh, they have to do something when they're going home. Got home tonight. Vegas has lots of talent. So does Florida. To Chuck just can't do it all himself. I know he's not the only talented player on Florida, but... Um, he's, he's, he's the one getting a lot of media. The, uh, the goalie for the Vegas Knights, uh, what is his name? Aiden Hill. Is that how you say it? Aiden. So he is on his, is this his third or fourth? Third. This is his third team. He was with the, uh, Arizona Coyotes, San Jose Sharks. And now he's with the Vegas Knights. Dude, dude's phenomenal. He is. Yeah. So the... I'll call it a pivotal game three tonight, TNT, 7 p.m. Vegas leads the series 2-0. Uh, if the Panthers, and, and my hopes of getting any of this right, because I said the Panthers in seven, because I thought they were on a roll, but, man, the Vegas Knights are just killing it. Yeah, and, I mean, honestly, I you know, I'm not saying too much. Yeah, they got 12 goals, but they did what they're supposed to do, defend home ice. Yeah, and now it's Florida's turn. So if Florida can flip the script and win a couple two one games, two no get two nil games. It could be, you know, like I said, tied two two and looking like yeah, we're gonna have a series. But, but the odds makers have Vegas favored in Florida. Yeah, yeah, and after like I said, after watching them skate around and get the shots they want and everything, it's I mean it's kind of like the NBA, right? Where you're, it's hard to pick against Denver when you watch the way they play basketball. It's like, you know, they've been favored every game. Obviously, they lost game two. But they've been favored every game uh, in the playoffs. So, same with Vegas. It's hard to pick against them when they're playing this well. 
It it truly is. Um, there, there's been some huge hits. There's been some uh, some interesting fights. I. I always find it interesting that you'll still get into a fight when it's playoff hockey. It's for fear you'll you'll get suspended, but they still right. do it. Yep. Um, a couple of them have, have come after some huge hits. Great hockey right now. Great hockey. Yeah, and you got game tonight, Thursday, and then they are off a day, and then they play again Saturday. So it could be over or could be looking to play through the weekend. Do they come back Saturday? I thought it was I thought it was a few days in between. Uh, just the one. The 10th. Yeah, they play Saturday the 10th. And then they'll have a few days and won't play again until Tuesday. Good grief. Talking about dragging out the playoffs. Good grief. Yeah. But, I mean, hey, good for them. NBA Finals. Okay. Ah. So, I I originally said Miami would take game one. They didn't. They took game two. Right. Um. So, Miami and Denver. Two very different teams. Oh my! Miami doesn't have a seven foot center. They they play really small. Um, the reason I bring that up, so Jokic he has won multiple MVPs. So have you ever won something you really didn't want, but everyone else thinks it's a big deal? Because yeah, Jokic likes the fact that he's won the MVP, but he would much rather have an NBA title. Oh, fact. Yeah, and. The previous two years shows just how much he carried them on his back without having Jamal Murray there. And now you have Jamal Murray, you have Porter Jr., you have Aaron, Aaron Gordon, Gordon. Yeah. you have Contavious Caldwell-Pope, who was with LeBron for a while but didn't fit LeBron's uh-huh. mold. So now he's with them just having just having an amazing, amazing time in mm-hmm. Denver Nugget land. Are are the Nuggets that close? Uh, can Pat Riley and Spolster figure it out? You know, it's like I talked yesterday when or Tuesday when we were together. It's funny how Miami won Game Two and everybody's like, "Oh, Miami has it figured out." I'm like, "Ah, oh, no, I think that was more of Denver not making shots than Miami making shots." Which Miami's big thing right now and the two losses are not making shots. They shot really bad, had very very low energy coming out. Uh, even uh, Butler said it, you know, which I don't get. And all that did was get the two guys, by the way, 30-point triple-doubles last night, first time ever in NBA Finals. Uh, we're talking about Jokic and Murray. Both had 30. Jokic, first one with 30, 20, and 10. Uh, they were a wrecking crew, just the two of them. Miami literally got beat by two people because the other guys really didn't show up. I mean... The side guys that we talked about, Aaron Gordon did. I take that back. Aaron Gordon had a really good game. Porter Jr., one for seven. Uh, Codwell Pope, one for four. Uh, Green played 17 minutes, put in four whole points. Brown, their other score is one for five. But there you go out with the two. I think it was like 86 or 89 of their 109 points was through Jokic and Murray. Yeah, Aaron Gordon actually had a double-double. A yes. quiet double-double. Very 10 quiet. rebounds, 11 points. But he made he made the biggest difference on defense. Yes. Playing Jimmy uh, Butler. I love Aaron Gordon. I man, I would love to have him on the Celtics. Seriously. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, uh, Miami hit more threes. Denver only hit five threes. Denver had 13 turnovers. Miami only had four. And normally, if you win the three point battle and the turnover battle, you should be in a game. And they lost by 15. So, yeah, my opinion, uh, Denver's got, obviously, talent-wise, you have Butler on the other side of a dial. Somewhere, I don't know, did you see why Hero did not play? All the talk was he was. I didn't get to see why he didn't play last night. They didn't mention it at all, oh. that, or, or at least that I heard. I was making, okay. I was taking some notes, but I, I did notice he wasn't in. They were talking about it. They were talking about it. Hey, he could play, he could play. Right. I think that was the media talking. I, I don't think Miami ever said anything other than he's questionable, he's been playing practice, but... I just don't think they want to push it. Other than right. that, I'm not sure. Yeah, same. I mean, there was some rumoring talk going into game two. He might show up for some valuable minutes. And I was like, okay, get your feet wet. And then I really expected him game three. And I say I worked last night, and I'm just trying to watch the replay when I got home. And I was like, I, but I couldn't hear any talk. And I was trying to look, and I, it just has him as out. But 
They weren't talking anything about Hero. During during the game when I watched it last night, they were talking about both Murray and Jokic. And then also what, what they did with their game planning. So I made a little note at about the 210 mark in the third period. 44 points in the paint for the Nuggets, 24 for Miami. So I last week I'd mentioned, can Miami continue? Will they make changes? Well, when the, the Nuggets came back after that loss and said, hey, we need to get back to our basics. We need to get points in the paint. And it wasn't just Jokic. No. Because he had amazing assists, and it, and it was people running the lane. It was Jamal Murray running the lane. And they finished, I think, with under 28% from behind the arc. The oh. Nuggets did. Yeah. And Miami actually shot better from behind the arc, but 44 points in the paint to 24. Yep. And they finished with 60-something in the paint. And yeah, they, from what I was seeing on the abbreviated version, what was it was Jokic Murray, pick and roll all day. Everybody stay wide. We'll kick out if it's there. But we're just going to have this two-man crew until Miami, you know what they say, if you can't, until they stop it, keep doing it. Right. And they just kept doing it. And, and what I loved about that pick and roll is that just like you just, they weren't going for the three-point line. Like the Bostons, the Suns, Sacramento's, Lakers, the Houston's, Philly, they do the pick and roll. Oh, I have to shoot a three. I got to stay behind this line. No, 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 no. A mid-range jumper is two points. It's just one less, but at least it's a bucket. And Murray numerous times came off, hit just off inside the paint, or I'm sorry, inside three-point line, or Jokic inside the paint, little baby jumper. It was great. Beat him with twos. Again, five threes. Today's NBA three-point shooting contest that we have night in and night out, they hit three, three, five threes and won the game by 15. What you just mentioned, again, made me think of uh, another Pat Riley quote. The key to teamwork is to learn a role, accept a role, and strive to become excellent playing it. And that's that's what, honestly, that's what uh, Miami forgot about a little bit last night and Denver just emphasized. Yeah, and that's 100% the Miami Heat philosophy. All of them, them guys know their roles. But on the flip side, you have uh, not Gabe Vincent, the other guy, Martin. Caleb Martin averaging 20-plus through the Eastern Eastern games. He has barely reached double digits. Vincent has been basically a no-show. I think he's only hit like six or seven shots through three games. He got frustrated. He right. got frustrated early. He had three quick fouls before the end of the half. Okay. So at half, the score was uh, the Nuggets 53 and Miami 48. So they were in it. So it was close. Yep. In fact, they traded leads a couple times. And then it got out of hand quickly in the third. T to illustrate, the start of the fourth, it was the Nuggets 82, Miami 68. Yeah, it was like a 29 to 20, I think, in the third quarter where Denver, like, took all the game. But again, on the flip side, game two, they went into the fourth quarter with the lead. Denver did. And Miami put it together. So I was kind of waiting for that. And obviously it didn't happen. But I said, these guys, I don't know. It could be the pressure of the finals. We saw it with the Celtics last year with their young team. Got in the finals and some of them big game, big moments. Couldn't hit shots. And Duncan Robinson, Vincent, Caleb Martin, and uh, Lowry. I, I mean. Kevin Love was pretty cold too. Yeah. <sighs> Another thing that jumped out to me for the Nuggets was uh, a rookie off the bench from Kansas, played in Kansas, won a national championship with Kansas, Christian Braun, a, or Brown, I'm Bra sorry. That actually led me into what uh, the announcers were making fun of him. Like, does he know how to say his name? Right. It's spelled B-R-A-U-N, but he pronounces it Brown. So anyway, that's another story for another day. Christian Brown runs the floor, runs into Jimmy Butler with contact and scores and gets an and one. So Jimmy looked a little gas last night. Jimmy tried to do everything he could, but also Christian Brown. Uh, there, I did it again. It's not Brown. It's, it's not Brown. It's Brown. Christian Brown scored ten points off the bench in thirteen minutes in the third. Yep, and, and was just on fire. He he had back to back buckets. One was off an assist, and then one was off that steal. It, the the kid the kid helps them so much coming off the bench, giving them just that little extra yeah. when, no, when they're already up and just deflated the Miami crowd. And, and I'm glad you mentioned a little gas. And we had said before the series started, <clears throat> excuse me, is that 
Miami has played a lot of games. This came off game seven with the Celtics battling. And I, I had a feeling they might be a little gassed. And it has kind of showed here and there that, I mean. They look and, tired at home. Yeah, and Bam and Butler are still playing 40-some minutes due to, you know, not a depleted bench, but not a lot of options on the bench. Yeah, and I just, yeah, you can definitely tell that uh, the fresh legs are definitely with Denver. They can, you know, talk about that humidity down there and all this and that, but I don't think Denver really had an issue with the humidity. The Miami Heat at half were at 39% shooting overall and 35, almost 36% from three point. And at half, Bam Adebayo already had a double-double with 10 rebounds and 13 points. But Bam and Butler can't do it all. No, uh-uh. And, and you... And you you talked about that earlier. Like, those those two need more help. Yep. And that's how they got here. You know, like I said, Vincent putting in 20-some points. Martin putting in 18 to 20 at times, you know. And then Duncan Robbins sneaking in 10 to 15. Yeah, it was a well-balanced, very team, like you said, with Pat Riley. Everybody knows their roles, and they play it, and they push it. And uh, Denver has definitely done a great job. What a What a game of adjustments when you get an extra day in between to be ready. Because, I mean, I mean, we saw the media. They're all already ready to hand them it to, oh, Miami wants it more. They're more complete. They got so many different ways to come at you. And then Denver says, hey, hold on, hold on. We weren't the best in the West for nothing. Yeah, there were only three players in double figures for the Heat. Uh, yep. Butler had 28, Adebayo had 22, and Martin had 10. Duncan Robinson was only shooting 50% <laughs> only. Only. That's ridiculous, I have to say only. Uh, but Martin went two for five, and Vincent was one for six. Yeah. that That's rough. Struess only was one for four with three points. Yeah. Lowry, I don't think, had a good shooting either. I think he was a one for a two for... F- oh, no, I think he had nine points, but like all... Four for nine or something like that. Yeah, he only had nine Some layups. Um, moving away from the finals a little bit, but did you hear that the Phoenix Suns are moving on from Chris Paul? Yes, and I'm so I didn't know if we were going to bring this up because we had this other thing we wanted to touch on, but yes, and I'm so excited because the rumor is to go to the Lakers. Really? Yeah, I didn't hear that part of the rumor. I was just watching this morning that there is in talks uh, that he could join. I guess maybe if Kyrie doesn't, uh, CP3 would be their backup plan. I don't know. Oh, that but was the I, other thing I wanted to talk about. Do you think Kyrie goes? I, I think I, with Kyrie, I have no idea. But I did hear Cubans already offered Kyrie the max. So for the Lakers to take him, they're going to have to up the ante a little bit to pull him away. So that's going to be iffy. Okay, better question. Does he make the Lakers better by going there? No, I don't think either one of them do, honestly. Uh, and, and that's why I'm excited. I hope CP3 goes uh, to the Lakers. Kyrie, I mean, you could send him over there. It'll be kind of like the Westbrook situation, I think. So getting back to that quote, don't you have to know your role? Uh, and there, there's there's two, where wherever Chris Paul goes to, he wants to be the starter, but I think at this point of his career, he needs to know his role, and that might be coming off the bench and being Fact. the bench coach. Fact. That's also still a player. Yeah. LeBron's well, close to that. Yeah. Don't, here's why I say LeBron's close to that. I think LeBron would be better utilized off the bench with fresh legs, not starting him, coming in, inject injecting some of that. He, he still has amazing talent, and he still has the energy. Yeah, yeah. he still has that energy, right. but... Let let let's let's use that as as potentially the sixth man of the year energy. Well, and like you said, we saw in the playoffs when he played long minutes. The next game, he was pretty much nothing. Yeah, give him twenty six, twenty eight minutes. Maybe every once in a while he hits the thirty minute mark. But yeah, use him sparingly. Six man come in, throw some energy, a nice ten o point run or something in there. But I I think his mentality is is no, I'm not. I don't know. I it might change next year. We'll see. Oh, no, it, it is his mentality. Yeah. Is, it's I'm still number one. Right. And with CP3, it's, you know, if he does or doesn't come off the bench, LeBron isn't a catch-and-shoot guy. So Chris Paul breaking down the defense and kicking it out to him, 
that's not his thing. He has to have the ball. He has to kind of get the feel for it and find out where he wants to be to take his next shot. Anthony Davis has shown that even with the guard, he'll have like, you know, he'll make some plays here and there off the dribble or off the pass, but it's not going to work game in and game out. And we've talked about it numerous times, even throughout the season, that Chris Paul hasn't won a championship because of Chris Paul. So with injuries, turnovers, no showing in big points of a game, I think he fits perfect. He's 38. He gets hurt a lot. That fits right in there with LeBron and uh, AD. So might as well. Let's make them all a one team. That's interesting because earlier in the week, I said this is going to be a very busy offseason, even though we're not in the offseason yet, and it started. Right. Because the Suns have a new front office, I'll say, and they're already starting to work on it. You got to, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would think you have to, yeah. don't you? And I also saw uh, Aiton is on um, the. They're looking for trades for him also. So I, yeah, I found that was that was huge. So we'll see what happens with the Dallas Mavericks core. Um, and again, I'll go back a couple years with them getting rid of Brunson, just so Donkic could have the full spotlight. Mark Cuban, I think you have a Donkic problem. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you have one star, but what does that get you? At least when you had Dirk Nowinski, he was willing to spread it around. He wasn't trying to do it all himself. Well, and you got to, and I get you have to have a superstar. Every team needs a superstar like Butler. But Butler knows I can't do it on my own. And for some reason, Donkic thinks he can, even though repeatedly has shown that you can't. You need all these other ones to go. You got to get them involved. And Jokic says it perfect. You know, he's, I'm just trying to get the team involved, move the ball around. That's why he finishes with triple doubles every night is because he's like, hey, it. I don't need you cold. I need you just as warm as when we start the game. Right. Game two, he had 41 points. He didn't have his triple double and they lost. Yeah. Well, only four assists and those four assists wasn't from the lack of trying. It was from them not making shots. Yeah. Another Pat Riley quote, excellence is the gradual result of always striving to do better. So we'll see if the Heat strive to do better on game, a very, very pivotal game three, Friday, ABC, 7.30. Early line, Denver favored by three with overs at 210 and a half. And before we move on, do you think Denver has even played their best game yet? Yeah, I think we've seen two of their best games in game one and game two. Or I'm sorry, game one and game three. Really? See? Yeah. I, I guess I don't, mainly because... It's only been the two big guys. You know, the other ones haven't done their thing. I'm still waiting for Pope to put in his 15 to 20. You know, uh, not Gordon, the other guy that we looked at. But anyway. Porter? I, yeah. We're, thank you. Porter also, coming into the finals, was a pivotal scorer for him. And I'm that's what I'm still waiting for. We're all five, six starters coming in there. I know it's only, I'm talking about their six men off the bench. There are five or six guys that are coming in that not necessarily are going to put in 25, but yeah. they all put in what they normally put in. I'm not disagreeing with you. I just have a different outlook because game one, Aaron Gordon had 16 points in 36 minutes. Porter Jr. was on the floor for 43 minutes and had a double-double, 13 rebounds, 14 points. Right. And then the one stat you can't see for Aaron Gordon again is that defense, that lockdown defense. He he had one block, um, and he's he's just done great. Now Jokic had a quiet twenty seven points, fourteen assists, and ten rebounds. Um, but then Caldwell Pope, he had seven points. He played thirty six minutes, and again, um, Bruce Brown put in a quiet 10 points and I, I I don't know. I, I think that when you can hold a Miami heat team to under a hundred points and, and keep them under 41% shooting overall under 34% shooting three point that screams, we play amazing defense and hitting 104 points for the nuggets with shooting 50% overall and not relying on the three-point. Granted, they put up 27 of them. Right. Only hit roughly 30% of them. They Again, they get a lot of their points in the paint. I, th- I, think, that's, I think that's showing you some great ball. 
But I, I could be wrong. I mean, they, they could come out and just then run the table in these next two games to get it done. Yeah, in that first game, there's two games now they've held Miami to under 100, which is, they do. They play great, D. We knew that coming in. But I, know I see what you're talking about, their points, but Porter was 5 of 16, Caldwell Pope 3 of 8, 1 from 3 from the three-point line. I mean, I, I've just seen them better just playing in the West. Miami plays great D, but when this team gets rolling, I'm I'm expecting a 130-point game either really, really soon uh, from the Denver Nuggets where the other guys are like, hey, these guys are taking so much pressure off of us. We need us to know go out there, play our role, shoot five of nine, seven of eight. You know what I'm saying? And hey, I'm not saying they had to put in 20. Like I said, they had 14. Pope's only got the seven, but I I can definitely see a 130 point coming from Denver where I'm like, okay, that's well, I what I want. That's what I knew Denver I could do. I don't know. I don't know if they can do that because this is, in my mind, two of the best offense and defensively matched teams right now. Now, yeah, Miami was an eight seed, but that's, in my mind, that's a false eight seed with the amount of games that all of their their starters and their role players off the bench had during the season. Before the All-Star break, if you tallied all of the games they missed, it was over 100. Right, yeah. So, so that led to them coming in late in the season on a roll and getting that eight seed, getting that play-in spot, and now they're finishing strong. I, I feel that both teams are playing amazing, fast-paced offense, great defense, but the key factors are Miami being a little more tired, having to put in all the extra work to get here with the play-in, with the seven games against Boston, because Miami dismantled Milwaukee. They did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 4-1. Yeah. Miami dismantled a great offense, Boston, and and now Miami is having a tough time trying to figure out all of the offensive weapons. It's not just two like the Celtics and two or three that the Bucks had. Well, well except for last night, uh, they all have them. Yeah, and, yeah. I I don't I don't know. So again, I'm not disagreeing with you that maybe they can't do better. The Nuggets, the the Nuggets could do better. Yeah. They they could. I just view it a little differently that that both of these teams are playing so amazing on defense that I don't think Denver will hit that 121-30 mark and potentially Miami gets another win. Maybe they don't. I, I, it, in my mind, this is a great final series. Right. I, yeah, and, man, and I don't like giving it just based on the one game, but based on what I've seen, uh, when we talk how great Eric is a coach, um, more, right, Denver's coach, more? I can't think oh, of Oh, man, come on. Okay, anyway. I can Denver, picture him. Right. Uh, Denver's head coach has done. Malone. Malone. Ah, well, at least I didn't him. Yeah. Um, he has done a great job uh, getting his guys ready, watching the film. He said they, they go over the film and showing each person individually what they did wrong and right on defense and this and that. So, man, he is definitely... Man, put it in, and I, I love that he's not just settling on being there and just getting caught up in the moment. He's just like the players are going all in, and I think it's great. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited, and let's see. I do. I still, I, I'll say it, I do believe Denver is in pace for a 130 game coming up before the series is over. They definitely could. They definitely could. And again, I, I love, I love how competitive this is because at half, it was a back-and-forth game, back-and-forth game. And I think Malone went in there and said, hey, let's try this, let's do this. And Spolster's team just couldn't keep up. Yep. So that, that was a fun game to watch last night. And unfortunately, the next one's Friday. Uh, I've been super busy at work, so I'll have to uh, catch the replay after the fact. Um, any other thoughts or anything else in the NBA world that come to mind? Because I remember the Chris Paul thing came up and I wanted to discuss. Yep. Um, and then, uh, like I said, uh, Aiton also, DeAndre Aiton was going to be on the look at different trades. Like you said, new front office, they had to make some moves. Um, 
you to me, yeah, you got to keep Booker and Durant together. Um, so the other thing for the for uh, for Chris Paul, yeah, there. You mentioned the Lakers. The other thing for Chris Paul that I thought of was okay. They're going to release him because of his huge contract, and they gave him that huge contract after he left the Oklahoma City Thunder because he was he he was having an MVP like uh, ser- like right. like season. Fact. He hasn't done that since. So will he? Swallow some pride and be like, "Yeah, I'm willing to come back for a fraction of what you're giving me." And or does he want to move on? And the Suns are set up for him to succeed. With you have a big guy like Aiton in the paint, you have a shooter like Devin Burke on the outside, and even before Durant, they had another guy. I'm not, I can't, you know, I'm not even thinking about the Suns right now. But anyway, he had a team where all he really needed to do was do. 10 to 12 points, 15 assists, and just lead the offense and make it run. And they they did. They had a decent season, obviously. But I'm like, I, I just don't get I said Chris Paul just kind of gets in Chris Paul's way. Wherever, wherever he goes, I just don't see that team. Like, again, uh, before I came over here, they said, you know, what about the Celtics? What do you do great on the Celtics with Brown and Tatum, you know, and Williams in the middle? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want him on the bottom. Boston mainly because he has not made any team better that he's been with. No, he hasn't. Right. So not not since the Oklahoma City Thunder. Right. And even they didn't win. They got, you know, beat also with him. I would rather have Shea Gilgis Alexander. Yeah. Oh, fact. Yeah. And but Chris Paul either no shows in the big moment or oh man, I'm hurt. I won't be able to play in these next two big games for you. So yeah. And then on the other thing on the NFL, uh Dalvin Cook got released this morning. That was huge. Huge. That was huge. And it was mainly for those that didn't don't know and haven't seen it, it was mainly contract. He wanted X dollars. They were willing to give Y. There's no meeting in the middle. So so many teams are out there that that want Dalvin Cook's services. If he goes to Dallas, then Ezekiel Elliott, there's no chance in Hades. He's, right. Fact. But I don't know if Dallas is willing to pay him. No, no. He's gonna. He's a ten million dollar a year, and there's no way. I mean, Dallas has already got their running back room, I believe, with uh, Pollard there. They picked up uh, what's his name from the Bucks. Where I was headed, there's a lot of teams I don't want to see him go. I I mean, I would love for him to go to Cincinnati or Buffalo. I if Cincinnati's really wants to win and get past Kansas City, get Dalvin Cook. If the Bills want to take over the East and not let the Jets right. or Miami sneak up on them, go get Dalvin Cook. And as a, as a as a Broncos fan, I would love to see him in Broncos land after the True. trouble that they had with their running back at the start of the season right. last year. And hey, maybe Sean, Sean Payne's making that call right now. Like, hey, we need a solid running game. We got to take the pressure off of oh, <laughs> Russell Wilson. Yeah. So I, huge. I, it, it'll be interesting to see what Sean Payton does there. Yep. Um, that being said, interesting to see what happens. We, when Roger, the Royal, we, when Roger was here, oh gosh, it was during football season. It, just just in, in conversation while we we're doing this, we were talking about uh, sports movies or movies in, with a sports theme, ho- however you want to talk about it. So last week I was talking to James, like, hey, what should we talk about this Thursday? And I'm like, Let, let's talk about movies. Let's talk about Movies. And it got brought up because you had to ask about a movie I had not seen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd misinterpreted the movie. Uh, so now it's, you know, me and the wife, it's going to be on the list. We'll have to check it out. Uh, the Trouble with the Curve. Trouble with the Curve. Clint Eastwood. I love Clint Eastwood. He's not a dynamic actor, but his sarcasm, the way he delivers a line and all them, I, I think it's great. Man of not many words, but many words. So, and he's in that movie. It looks It looks really funny. Um, so yeah, we're going to, we're going to have to put it in. And when we were doing our research on these and we had talked, there's a lot of really good movies out there, sports movies that I had not seen yet. Okay. So I, we're going to, we're going to talk about trouble with the curve for just a little bit. Okay. So I mentioned it and you're just like, no, that's a chick flick. Right. And I, and I personally brought up the fact that I hate that term. And then you explained what you thought. Well, it deals with relationships and then. JT, Justin Timberlake's in it, and then he tries to have a relationship with Amy Adams, and Amy Adams plays Clint Eastwood's daughter. Right. So I'm 
turn this off if you haven't watched Trouble with the Curve and you hate spoilers. <laughs> Trouble with the Curve is about Gus, played by Clint Eastwood, and he's an aging sports agent. Or not agent. Scout. scout. There you go. I said it wrong. He's a scout. And this movie looks at a lot of stuff. It looks at a person in a, in a, in a career who's aging and is getting up there and what an organization will do to push him out. It's looking at relationships between a father and daughter who also, he lost his wife early on when she was young and then he had to be a single parent. Also deals with baseball on what happens in baseball. John Goodman is in it. Amy Adams is in it. Justin Timberlake is in it. Um, it's actually just a, a huge cast. And... I agree with you when you watch the trailer for it. Thank you. When you watch you. the trailer for it, you look at it like, oh, my gosh, that's like a, a soap opera trailer. They're talking about, right. oh, how they fall in love on the road. Well, it, and it's more than that. Right. But that's what I'm saying. Whoever put that trailer together didn't really sell what the movie was about or to did pull they? in a crowd. I think they, they did that trailer to pull in the female demographics. Because when oh. you look at trailers, you have to look at what did the marketing department want to do. And when you market a, a movie, market a movie to people. So you're going to pull the sports people in when you sh show a baseball. Boom. You're going to pull in the Clint Eastwood people that want to see Clint Eastwood. You're going to pull in the, the John Goodman people that want to see John Goodman do a great role. And I got a burp. I apologize. Uh. There it is. Right at you. You're going to pull in the people that think Amy Adams are cute. And then you're going to pull in the people that think Justin Timberlake are cute. And then you put all that together and whoever was given his parameters on, hey, we want you to put a trailer together, make it look cute. They did their job. Oh, they did. That being said, this movie is closer to if you mixed Moneyball with, uh, with something else. You you would get this. <laughs> I, I did enjoy Moneyball. I like the behind the scenes thing of putting a roster together based on averages and, you know, making the best of the moments and not the name behind it and what they did in the past. It's what they do normally year to year. And I mean, Oakland almost won by it, but Moneyball has not won yet, by the way. Right. And also the name for this movie the the story is about a snotty little brat kid. And he was the reason this movie got its name. Right. And the scout figured it out that he has trouble with the curve by the sound because he's losing his sight. Anyway, that's, that's my pitch for this movie. Right. Um, and then, so we get in, we're, we're getting into this. So, before we go on to either one of our lists, because that actually didn't even, I didn't even get that in my list, but I'm glad you brought it up because it has, it has a funny backstory. Like, I don't want to watch it. It's a chick flick. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, t I'll give you that. Yeah. I'll give you that. It, it has, it has all the criteria. Right. And it's almost like a date movie, you know, oh, where it totally. you're not going to go with, you go with like three of your friends and going to go watch the program or remember the Titans or the replacements or even draft day. But when you watch the previews for Trouble with the Curve, we're not bringing three of my friends and we're going to go watch it. We're going to bring, hey, hey, babe, you want to go see this? Yeah. You know? No, I get it. Right. I get it. Now, if you watch it and think it think it sucks, I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay I'm going to be that. free, so it won't matter. Even better. Right. So, this didn't make my list, but this movie, Miracle, should officially change its name to Miracle on Ice because that's how everyone refers to it. Yes. And that is the movie about the Olympic team that beat basically the all-pro Russian hockey team. So that being said, we'll start out with some of your top movies. All right, so how I, I picked, there's a lot of good movies I like that I watched one time. I was like, that's a really good movie. Uh, Moneyball is one of them. But if it comes on, I'm not changing the channel to it repeatedly. So my list, my number one movies are movies that when these come back on, TNT, TBS, whatever the channel may be, uh, I will watch it again just because it's that entertaining. And my top two uh, is football. I'm a, obviously a football guy. So uh, the program, and you guys bear with me here, The Last Boy Scout with Bruce Willis. 
it is a football movie based on betting within the sport and the behind the scenes and setting games and all that. So I consider that a football movie. So The Last Boy Scout in the program, probably two of my top football movies. Uh, also, too, because we listed lots of sports, right? So I went with Blood Sport with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Oh, heck yeah. And also, one of the best fighters ever whose career was shortened up is Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee, which is a world martial arts tournament. Those two movies could come on, and I will I will forget to change the channel. I'm not even lying. So, yeah, so my top two football program, Last Boy Scout, and then Blood Sport and Enter the Dragon. And honestly, Enter the Dragon beats all of them. I would watch that over any of them, so... Uh, did you want me to keep going? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to interject something. Yeah, so when we ahead. did this, I started asking a bunch of people and, and I had to whittle down my list from 63 movies and I could have kept going. Right. Right. And, and that's, that's why I wanted to do this because this, this is so fun. So, so you'd mentioned, um, football movies. I want to interject one, and this is my top movie made before I was born about football, Brian's Song. Made in the 70s, it was an ABC movie of the week, and it's about the real-life story of Brian Piccolo and Gail Sayer, Say, oh, Sayers. There you go. That's the word I couldn't say. Love Gail, Gail Sayers. Gail Sayers' friendship and Brian Piccolo's terminal cancer. Um, great movie, and it's about football. But there's great movies about football. Right. Necessary Roughness, uh, my top comedic sports movie. I I mean, how can you go wrong? Okay, so back to your list. Oh, and so we got more football at the top. And I try to keep it because, like you said, there's so many I watched. I'm like, yeah, I would. So me and the wife, she was helping me write these down on our little drive. So, I again, these are ones that I will watch over and over. Uh, Remember the Titans, The Replacements. Me and her watched that one. That's one of her favorites also, The Replacements. Loves that movie. Is it uh, Keanu Reeves in The Replacements? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Hackman. Gene Hackman's in it. Uh, is The Replacements the one where, who's the star that picks up the football and throws it and breaks the guy's nose? Is that The Replacements or is that, uh, or is that the Damon Wayans movie that I'm thinking? Yeah, of? that's Damon Wayans where they're at the party and he's sitting in the hot tub yeah. and he throws a football. Yeah, that's the last Boy Scout. Okay, that is the last Boy yeah. Scout. Okay, yeah. sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. He, yeah, he was trying to drown a girl in the hot tub. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, and then baseball, Eight Men Out. Uh, a great movie about the Black Sox. Um, then you have... <laughs> so we had talked about this movie and said the wrong name so many times. And then... We're driving, and Krista goes, uh, how about For the Love of the Game? And I went, what's that one about? And she's reading it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, babe, that's the one I've listed as The Perfect Game. Yeah. So the Kevin Costner movie that we kept saying The Perfect Game is actually named For the Love of the Game. Yeah. So it's a Kevin Costner baseball game where he pitches a perfect game against the Yankees. Great, great movie. Uh, Longest Yard with Adam Sandler. Uh, I watched the Burt Reynolds one as a kid. I thought it was good, but the Adam Sandler, where I knew more of the people in the movie, was it, just really good. Isn't it fun that they do remakes of that? Because White Men Can't Jump was remade, and I recently watched, and I think both are good. Um, staying on the football theme, my honorable mention football ones, Varsity Blues. No. I know, and I know. And, and that's, it's a polarizing movie because it's, it's almost comedic, bad teen drama. Right. Because it is. Yes. It is. And then North Dallas 40, which you told me you hadn't seen. Right. But you showed me the previews, and I'm going to have to put that on my list as that looks really funny. Production value, it's not that great because it's you can't, it's tough to compare movies that are made now and they're production wise, they're flawless. But then you have something like that, which talks about so many different things. It, it, it's a satire about the party and days of football back in the day, and it's an amazing movie. All right, uh, continue. I'm sorry. Um, these two movies I had to write together because it's the same movie. Tin Cup, Bull Durham. Oh, yeah. So Tin Cup is the golf version of Bull Durham. Bull Durham is the baseball version of Tin Cup. It's both Kevin Costner. It's both about a guy that I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to make this succeed, make this work, blah, blah, blah. Again, both really, really, really good movies. Uh, 
Uh, White Man Can't Jump, of course. You had to put that on there. Uh, Major League. Who can't not watch Major League every time it comes on? Wild Thing. Wild Thing. Yeah. He's back. So Horrible yeah. picture until he gets glasses. Oh, what a great story idea. Right. Um, this movie, I don't know if you've seen. So we're sitting there driving. And I was like, babe, there is a soccer movie with Sylvester Stallone during the war. And they were trying to play and show that they can compete as pri- they were all prisoners of war, a soccer team. Anyways, great movie, great story. And I couldn't think of the name of it. So she's starting to go through and reading all these. Oh my goodness, Stallone has a lot of movies. He does. It's called Victory. Really? I right. haven't seen it. Oh my gosh, so good. Uh, he he plays the goalie. And oh, of course he does. I, honestly, so he can save the day. Right. World War II. Um, anyway, yeah, so if you guys get a chance, and again, it's back in the 70s, late 70s movie, but it is a really good story. I, I think it's great. And then, of course, uh, Days of Thunder and League of Their Own are two other movies that I can watch uh, several different times. Great. Okay. So if I heard correctly, your list was all about if they come on, I will rewatch them. And, and to right. me, that's the sign of a great movie. There, there's movies you want to see once and it's a great movie, but to watch it again, you're just like, eh, I've already seen it. Right. Every movie that you've mentioned, I, I would. I would seriously sit down and watch it again because there's something either you're going to see again, be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that, or, oh, my gosh, I didn't pick up on that, or, oh, I love this scene. D- like, yeah, yeah, the the gameplay or the comedy and whatever, you still you still find yourself chunk or replacements. When they're singing in the jail together, I still chuckle. When they start the bar fight, I still chuckle. Right. You know, last yeah. Boy Scout when he throws the ball at the guy's nose. Oh, gosh. I know it's coming and I still love it every yeah. time. Yeah. All right. I'm going to start out my list with, I broke it down into some categories. And I, I also, I did this because I also wanted to do movies that would probably differ from your list. So to give give another broad broad list. And again, I had 63 movies because I was asking everybody at work. I was asking friends and family, like, hey, give me some stuff. And I'll start off with motorsports. My top movies in motorsports. There is a movie starring Anthony Hopkins, and he plays a New Zealander called Burt Monroe. It's the world's fastest Indian. World's fastest Indian. Came out in uh, 2005. The story is about this guy who rebuilds a 1920 Indian motorcycle. He then used this motorcycle to go to Utah's Bonneville Salt Flats. And at 68, he was 68 years old. He set a land speed record. 178 miles an hour. At a, 68 years old, you're going 170 miles an hour. Yes. Woo! Yes. Heart's racing. I love that movie. And I, I've, I've watched it so many times. I made my dad watch it. And he's just like, oh, my gosh, this is a great movie. I've, I've made so many people watch it. And, it. and if you love movies about motorsports, motorcycles, I think it's a great movie. What, one of my favorite scenes is he, he gets over to the United States and he's trying to test out his motorcycle because it's shipped. And, of course, anything that's ever shipped is jostled around by a handler who doesn't care because it's not his package. Fact. And the package is this really temperamental motorcycle that's basically a... Frankenstein. Machine for speed. (laughs) So he's on the highway in Nevada where they have no speed limits. And he meets a cop, and the cop finally gets, gets up to him because Burt Monroe pulls over, and he's like, do you have an idea of how fast you're going? Well, I think probably around 150, 160. He's like, yeah, no, I know we don't have any speed limits, but just be careful. Right, right. Yeah. (laughs) He'd be like, no, but I was hoping you could tell me. Yeah, yeah. And there's another scene where he's in his homeland of New Zealand. Um, Back in the day, they had some motorcycle clubs. And the young kids heard about this old guy because he would build his own motorcycle parts. He would cast his own pistons make his own flywheels because he wanted certain specs. I mean, again, that's another reason why I love this movie because it's it's a guy who who didn't rely on buying the parts. He built them himself to get to the specs he wanted. 
So these kids hear about them that are in a motorcycle club and challenge them to a race. Off the starting line, the motorcycle dies. And these kids have like a half a beach head start. He gets his buddies to push start him and he flies by them like they're standing still. Jeez. Right? He loses because he falls over in the turn. Fast forward, he's he's having a party, going away party so he can go overseas to get this land speed record. The motorcycle comes in and hands him a cash gift to help him because they won his they 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 won or he won their respect. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I got you. Okay, so great movie. So fast forward, the other one, Ford versus Ferrari. Came out in 2019. Matt Damon is Carol Shelby and Christian Bale is the late Ken Miles. Again, if you like speed, if you like racing, great story. Yep. And uh, the main thing is Ford is trying to win the 24-hour Le Mans. And it, almost it, it, worked right. against themselves. Yeah, it, it wants to put it on there. But again, as typical Americans that we do, somebody wants to be in the limelight and do it their way and be, you know, and not letting the professionals handle the, the driving part. So, yeah, really good movie. I have it on my list as far as I can watch it here and there. It's still a lot more drama than what I want. But watching it the first time when me and the wife watched it, we liked it a lot. I mean, Christian Bale, Matt right. Damon, great, great movie. Tied with this movie, Motorsports is also Shelby American, the Carol Shelby story. It's a 2019 biography about Carol Shelby. You learn that he started out as a chicken farmer and a part-time racer, then went on be to become one of the winningest race car drivers ever. And he is the only person to have won the Le Mans as a driver and a manufacturer. Oh, wow. So I those, know that one. Yeah, those two movies came out at roughly the same time. Um, Shelby American was on Netflix. I don't think it is anymore. I could be wrong. Um, but Shelby American, the Carol Shelby story, I'm not sure where that's streaming at, um, but I think it's still out there somewhere. My top boxing movie is Bleed for This. And... It's a 2016 movie about a world champion boxer, Vinny Paz, or Vinny Pazianezzi, and he held world titles as a lightweight and a light middleweight. Uh, the movie centers around his comeback after a brutal car accident and spinal cord injury. So it's, it's a movie about boxing, but also kind of a comeback story about how he overcame all odds. The, the doctors told him, you're not going to box again. Their doctors told him, hey, we're going to fuse your spine. And they said, if we do it, you're never going to box again because you're not going to have the articulation that you need. So he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. You're going to put me in a halo. Uh, I'm going to hopefully heal. And while he's in a halo, like e even the slightest bit of the wrong movement or a jolt and he could be paralyzed, he started working out with weights again. All right. So again, a great movie that I think is a great comeback movie, but it's also about boxing. And then... Top comedic sports movies, you, uh, The Sandlot. I, I think I could watch that movie on repeat. And, and I did, actually, when, when, I, when one of my nephews was a little kid, he, he couldn't stop watching that movie on repeat. Um, Necessary Roughness, Re Necessary Roughness in 1991, just, just to complete, just. And that one's right there with Wildcats for me. Yeah. Wildcats well, and, and Wildcats Necessary Roughness. Is, yeah. Not that they're the same, but it's one of those that came out within same time period. And it was. Very similar movies. Yeah, I love They were both very funny, very good movies. The Great White Hype. 1996 movie with Samuel L. Jackson, Damon Wayans, and Jeff Goldblum. And then Dodgeball. Um, I added poker. Yeah, not a sport, but they have it on ESPN. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll include it. Rounders. Rounders is a very good movie. Yes. Um, and this is a stretch, but my top movie about esports, Ready Player One. Ah, the the kid who sits in his futuristic trailer that's that's they built into a high rise trailer housing community, and he's got to win the game to to keep society going. Right. And then honorable mentions: Real Steel. Yes. Oh, that didn't make my list, but yeah, that one. I don't, I don't, I don't even know how you put it into a category with sports, but it's it's, it's uh, boxing. It, yeah, it's or WWE meets boxing. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. Some machine boxing. Yeah. What, Hugh Jackman. What was uh, the TLC? Was it TLC that had the the uh, robot wars? Oh, uh, or was it Discovery? Yeah, I think it's anyway, Discovery. But yeah, Real Steel is, is is part robot wars, part boxing. Yeah. Um, Bill Russell Legend is a two part series on Netflix. Amazing, amazing. That that was an eye opener to me. Uh, a recent movie, Air, about the Michael Jordan shoe. It's more not, about Nike than Jordan. It, right? it is. It is. Um, and, it, and it's interesting how how that whole thing came about because at the time Nike was just a running shoe. They were below Converse. Yeah, Converse yeah. actually had the tops at that time. Yep. Um, and then Adidas, and I learned that Adidas kind of faltered for a while because their uh, patriarch passed away, and he was the one who was running the company. So then all the kids and all the family kind of fought for a little while. Yep. So it was mayhem. Um, and then the honorable, the last two honorable mentions are just completely ridiculous. Caddyshack and Kingpin. Both have Bill Murray. Both are ridiculous. And both are amazing. And my honorable mentions, Caddyshack's number two. Yeah. yeah I'm with you. Yeah. I Okay. Uh, on the honorable mentions I had, and again, these are... Sports, but like you said, they're a little like not necessarily over the top because of program. I know some of these movies, but these are like more like, uh, you know, I, I can watch it for the funny part. Uh, Happy Gilmore, obviously, Adam Sandler and Golfing, Caddyshack, Waterboy, Dodgeball is another one. It's is it is a sport, uh, but that movie is just more comedic than oh, it is Dodgeball. It's ridiculous. Right. Uh, but even Lance Armstrong shows up in it. Yes. Before yeah. all the mayhem. Before, right. Oh. Uh, Talladega Nights. Yes. Uh, the 2002 version of Rollerball. There was a 70s version. The 2002 has LL Cool J and a couple of the newer actors. Really good movie. As Sandlot, Little Giants, and Bad, New Bear, Bad News Bears. Yeah. On that list. Yeah. So. Uh, part of my 63 movie list, I, I had The Wrestler on there. I had The Fighter. I had Johnny B. Good. Jerry Maguire. Brewster's Millions as a ridiculous yeah. movie because yeah. they're they're playing baseball. That out. one needs to come on a little bit more. Brewster Millions, I need to put on replay here soon. Yeah, they're playing baseball and they have to wait for a train to go through the outfield. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, it's ridiculous. Semi-pro for a ridiculous oh, man. basketball movie yeah. that's kind of based on reality, actually. But, of course, Will Ferrell's got to give it his Will Ferrell shtick. And then an old Disney movie, The Absent-Minded Professor, where he invents flubber and they use it in a basketball game and they can jump like crazy. Uh, right. and, yeah. Um, point Break. I, I know this is going to be a stretch, but right. surfing movie. Right. That's also... Um, Robin Banks. Robin Banks is a sport. <laughs> so you'd mentioned Wildcats. I was going to say, and it, it took me... I was just like, oh, gosh, how am I going to break this down? Right. And when I left off that, while we're sitting there talking, when you're talking about your boxing, I totally don't know how Rocky didn't get put on our list with us, you know, talking and doing things. See, I didn't put it on my list because I thought you were going to mention it. Right. So, and I realized I had, I had seen Rocky 2 and 3 before I saw Rocky 1 because I was a young pup. I didn't, you know, there's not cable TV. So I had seen 2 and 3, then I ended up seeing 1. But, yeah. Rocky two and three, one's good, but it's mostly about his relationship and becoming fighter and blah, blah, blah. But two and three, I think are really good. Three is amazing. Uh, but that Rocky series all the way, th uh, well, I guess I kind of stop at four because then they get a little crazy. But Rocky movies, I think, are very good sport movies that when they come on, you, you just get caught up watching it. How about another Sylvester Stallone movie that was made my 63 list over the top? All, yeah, all, all, of, all about arm wrestling. Yes. I, I mean, so th there's eight seconds, the grudge match with De Niro. Yep. I, I mean, <sighs> Karate Kid, both Karate Kids. There's a Kenny Rogers movie about racing six pack. Yes. And that's a big NASCAR for you NASCAR fans. If you have not seen six pack, it's uh, back in the day, I want to say early 80s, maybe mid 80s. Kenny Rogers is a race car driver these kids start stealing stuff and he finds out that they're really mechanical savvy. Uh, he needs a pit crew. He makes them into their pit crew. Uh, 
you know, obviously different things happen here and there, but they don't have to go into win a race. Very, very good movie. A very family feel good movie. Uh, again, that one just has not come on. They might want to replay that one or I don't know, maybe it's on Netflix. I have no idea or HBO Max something. But that movie, if you're a NASCAR fan, you need to watch that one. Cinderella Man, Invincible. Again, these are these are movies that that made my list that I didn't give a whole lot of yep. of uh, speaking time to. And then Forty Two, the movie about Jackie Robinson, yep. and That's on my list now to see. Yeah, and, and then Sea Biscuit. Yeah, not going to see that. One. I know, I know, <laughs> and it's I I brought that up at last here because. Um, Roger and Jeremy Weiss at work always have this interesting conversation. Who was the best athlete? Who was the best athlete? And and Jeremy likes to kid Roger a little bit and say, well, I think it's Seabiscuit. He was, or, or Secretariat. Right. I think they're the absolute best. Right. They won triple crowns for crying out loud. Right, right. Um, a couple of the movies I have on my at least watch once. I've Again, if you hadn't seen them back in the day, any given Sunday, Above the Rim, We Are Marshall. Oh, yeah. Really good movies. Uh, the Blind Side. Um, it's the Michael Orr story from, uh, the Baltimore Ravens and Kim, uh, I'm sorry, Sandra Bullock talking about a, a kid that, you know, down on his luck, doesn't have family, gets adopted and goes on to be a great football player. Field of Dreams wasn't brought up too much. I, I like the movie, but it's, again, there's a lot of drama, a lot of sad. I'm not a big fan of a lot of sad. And so Field of Dreams is in there. Hoosiers, Rudy. Uh, draft Day, we talked about that. Now, draft Day is a really good movie as far as behind the scenes on getting ready for the draft and all the pressure of making that first pick. And if it doesn't pan out, you know, you can be fired. Matthew Lillard is in that movie, isn't he? Not sure. Um, the reason I bring that up, he is also he is also in the movie Trouble with the Curve. Um, and as I'm going as I'm to try to hear... Uh, draft day cast. Figure out if he's in that because I want to say he is. He's. Uh, I thought he was one of the main reasons trying to go against what Costner wanted. And maybe I'm completely full of crap, but yeah, and and it's a interesting play because the Cleveland Browns we know had numerous number one picks or top three picks, and. In this movie, it talks about how they all want this as one guy's as consensus number one, the consensus number one. Everybody, everybody says Cleveland's going to pick him. Kevin Costner's doing his homework and starts realizing that this guy is not quite the team player, quite the team leader that you would need from that position. And he starts going away, and everybody's like, wait, wait, wait. No, no, this is, you know, yeah. So there's a lot of, you know, you're going to lose your job. You don't make this pick. You're going to be out of here. And, you know, I won't spoil the movie, but it just comes down to, you can't pick the name. You got to pick the talent. And like back Trouble yep. the Curve, you got to listen to the scout. And I was wrong. I'm, I'm thinking about Trouble the Curve and Trouble the Curve only, and I was trying to okay. combine them both. But yep. yeah, um, draft day is amazing about how you hit the nail on the head. You have to look at the talent, not just the name. Right. And Trouble with the Curve also examines that because this guy, this kid, everybody's talking about how great he is, how great he is. And yeah, he's great at some things, but he's not... A, the overall best for the number one pick. Right. Um, before we do final thoughts, one more Pat Riley quote, the most difficult thing for individuals to do when they become part of a team is to sacrifice. It is much easier to be selfish. That's a fact. That's a fact. All right. Final thoughts. Uh, let's go with today in sports. Uh, as a huge Yankees fan, it is Mickey Mantle Day. Today, 1969, Mantle gives his farewell retirement speech uh, in front of 60,000 people and uh, watched oh, wow. his number seven be retired. Yeah. You're talking about back then in the day in front of a, a baseball stadium, Mickey's final game. Yeah. Uh, 2001, Ray Bork, uh, for you hockey fans, the great Ray Bork, played his final game in his NHL career. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in 2001. And also in 2002, uh, for you boxing, Lennox Lewis knocked out uh, uh, Michael Tyson. Wow. To uh, keep his heavyweight title. And then in the NBA Finals realm, 2018, the Golden State Warriors claimed their third title in four years, pushing the dynasty button. 
uh, with a sweep over Cleveland. And of course, Kevin Durant is named the MVP. So a lot of uh, French Open and uh, golf going on for a lot of those sports. And I'm good grief. There was so many French Open finals things for today in sports. I was like, oh my. So, but we don't have a whole lot of tennis fans that we know. So I'm just scooped right over those. I, um, I'm wondering what's going to happen after the NBA finals with all of the free agents that are available and all the moving that could go on. Also, to play into that, the number one draft pick. I thought about this during you talking about the movie Draft Day. That was about football, but this French kid, he, he's either going to be everything they thought or he's not. And I, I, I don't want that for the kid because that can be crushing to a person's soul to be told he's everything and then ushered out of the league in two to three years. Well, I mean, it's... Does anyone know how he can do a pressure? Because when you come in number one pick and then the city is like, oh, he's going to bring us back to the promised land. And by the way, he's only 19, you know, and he's so going, weighs 120 pounds. So going to the Spurs, I hope Popovich can have a great impact on him. And if, if he's at the point where he was with Derek White and tells Derek White, this isn't a winning team, and you are an amazing talent. I want you to go to a winning team. I hope Pop can do that for this kid. Yeah, and he's going to one of the best coaches. So. I mean, someone that can keep him level-headed, take the pressure off of, hey, we don't need you to go out there and score 40 and 20 every night. We don't right. need you to be Jokic. Just go out there and play your game. So, yeah, he's with a really good coach that can get the fundamentals out of him, get the team play. And who knows? I mean, the Spurs got some talent, you know, got some young talent. They bring in a big guy. Uh, again, I'm not saying he's Jokic, but he's in that same mold, you know, just about 200 pounds lighter. Uh, he, he's a small guy. He's going to have to be like the Durant, get in the gym. When Durant came in the league, he even said, I, you know, I don't go to the gym. I can't stand lifting weights. Then he played in the NBA, and he's like, I better get in the gym and lift some weights. And now, now they said Durant's almost like a gym rat. Yeah. Fell in love with it. So, yeah, same thing with this kid. He's probably going to have to learn the ins and outs and nuances of being in a gym and building up some muscle. Isn't it funny how you have that? Jokic went on to lose, what is it, 30, 40 pounds? Yeah. And, and had to do that same thing, H had to go to the gym and work out more just to get to the point where he is. And then you have the Durants who need to put on the weight rather than lose it yeah. to get to where they're at. So. And Durant Murray, I'm sorry, Jokic and Murray playing 40-plus minutes just about every game, and they still look fresh. So back on the – I know I'm huge, going way back. with Huge conditioning. Yeah, Harden and – uh Donkits and all them that, oh, I can just carry this around. No, it's a grind. It's more of a grind in the postseason than it is in the regular season. There's no games off in the postseason. One, one more final thought about NBA, and you mentioned Harden. Harden hasn't looked the same since he's left Houston. Houston, and, and decided to go as lazy as he could to put on some weight to make a statement to get out of there. He has never recovered from that. No, I think he fell in love with it. It's easy to be... I can't say easy to be lazy, but it's it's a lot less work when you don't go to the gym. You know what? I'm not going to go shoot around today. Uh, nah, I'm, I'm good. I, I, I'm good. You know, I'll make that tomorrow. And that almost makes me sad because he was one of the best he players. Scores. Carmelo Anthony comes to mind. Every time somebody talks about Harden, I think of Carmelo except Harden can dribble and Anthony couldn't. Is They're strictly scores. They were never known for very good D. Harden needs to be moved to the small forward short... I, I know you got to have the ball in his hand and he creates off the dribble, but you just need him to just make jump shots. Hey, dude, I, I can't have you handling the ball for 23 of the seconds on my play clock. I need you to catch and shoot. Right, right. Do you think having had someone like a Rajon Rondo in a Houston Rockets uniform with him when he was one of the leading scorers would have helped him? Yes. Or or would he, he have still been the same James Harden and never let Rajon Rondo touch the ball? Uh, I guess that would depend on the coaching. But Rondo, I loved Rondo. I had his jersey. I still have his jersey. I wish the Celtics never would have got rid of him. I do realize that there's a lot of attitude and there was some immaturity that Danny Ainge didn't want to deal with. But look how well he made the Celtics. He couldn't make a jump shot. We know that. I mean, he's barely good at the free throw line. Horrible shooter. 
But the way, like I said, with the Celtics right now, you need a guy to break down the defense, kick it out, or make layups here and there. That was Rondo. When he was with Pierce and all them guys, he's like, man, I don't have to score. I know, but do you think do you think Harden would have taken that role and like, hey, Rondo, come in here and help me? It it all depends if the coach is like, hey, this is going to be our point guard, or does he say, Rondo, hey, you guys just kind of play off of each other because then, no, it wouldn't have worked because Harden would have never passed it, like Jokic and Kyrie Irving right now. So a coworker, Cleveland Gonzalez, had mentioned this to me this last week. He said, I think it's more about players anymore than having the great coach because you can have a great coach, but when they're out there playing, you need to have that person that is a field general that does everything, that is able to make the decisions at a split second, not wait for the coach, but take over the game. And and we have a few of those right now. A few. Only a few. And that's only I would I would disagree with Cleveland is Denver doesn't have that. Denver don't have that guy. You can see it when they fell apart in game two uh, in the fourth quarter where they went in there with a the lead. If they had that guy was like, okay, this is what we need to do. Like LeBron. I'm not a big LeBron fan, but LeBron's like, okay, hey, this is a game. This is a situation. This is what we need to run. Murray and Jokic out there, they do what the coach says. Hey, this is a play we're going to run, or we got and we got to make open shots. Denver don't have that. They're, they're the best team in the West, and oh, by the way, they're on the verge of winning the finals without that. Now, flip it. Miami has that in Jimmy Butler. You can see in the fourth quarter when he took over against the Celtics and others where he's like, okay, this is what we need to do to win this game. Game two against Denver, this is what we're going to do to take over fourth quarter and win the game. They have that. Denver does not, and Denver looks like the better team. Any other final thoughts? Oh, that was just my opinion. But no, no, yeah. no, no, it's all good. That's yeah. all good. That's why I wanted to bring it up. Yep. I, I, I see what Cleveland's saying, but on the flip side, I think he'd more mentioned team. Michael Jordan. Right. Yeah, and one of the few. And you could put Magic and even Bird on there. And then we also talked about Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers. We, we, we talked about Brett Favre. We, we, we talked about uh, some other things in some other sports. So I, I see both sides of that. And and I see that if you don't have a great coach willing to make some adjustments, you better rely on some great players to do that. So conversely, I look at it from a Celtics fan standpoint that I don't feel that our coach being so young isn't necessarily great yet because he has a lot of learning to do. He has some good talent, but can he take that good player to make them great? Because on the floor, they're making some very selfish mistakes. Yeah, Boston don't have that guy. And sometimes they do. Sometimes they'll listen to Marcus Smart. Sometimes they'll listen to Horford, Jalen Brown, Horford. Yep. Sometimes they'll listen to Derek White. And sometimes they go, no, I'm just doing it all myself. Right. And then everybody gets mad at each other. And if you have that guy, they listen to that guy all the time. But when it's random... And you can have a good team. Denver's probably the same way where they kind of all get their feel. Everybody gets a feel of what it is. Boston has that where they're all played with each other a while now and you can listen to each other who's going to, okay, yeah, I'm, okay, let's try that. But when everybody's being selfish and no one's listening to each other, then oh, you they get play a horrible. debacle. Right, yeah. It, when, when they're unselfish and they run their offense and all compare them to a Golden State Warriors, when they're all moving, when yeah. they all stay in motion, they're great, yep. but when they all just stand there, and by they, I mean Tatum just stands mm -hmm. there waiting, mm -hmm. doesn't move. Grant Williams. Horrible. Yeah, and so, and I, I agree, Joe's young. I know we're about to go. Is My thing with Joe is he's an offensive guy, and he wants that flow, moving around, doing this and that. But if a player becomes unengaged or, you know, you know I'm just not feeling it today, again, you can't take a game off in the playoffs because, you know, you could go home. Joe's like, Dude, when we're watching film, like, why? You know, obviously they're not going to bring that in the media, but yeah, as a young coach, you got to be able to call them out and make them, make them play, make them run the offense. Exactly. Yep. Blue Collar Sports Talk. I'm Daryl. See you. That was James. Go watch some sports, and for something new and different, to uh, maybe introduce you to Scotty McCreary, if you don't know who that is, we'll give you his song in between to take us out of here.
sunny. 